Hi, my name is Jesse Green. This is the class for Parker University's Continuing Education Department. Our topic today is boundaries. In the context of the doctor-patient relationship, we're going to talk about patient confidentiality and sexual misconduct. Uh, this lecture will last for a little more than an hour and a half. The uh, video or vodcast will be divided into two sections to make it a little bit easier for you to download and use. In our relationships with other people, we have boundaries. Those boundaries define what we can do, what we cannot do, and what we have the option of doing. If those boundaries are clearly communicated and agreed upon, we usually have healthy relationships. The problems with our relationships usually happen either because we haven't discussed or communicated the boundaries or because we don't agree on where the boundaries lie. Of course, the classic example of a boundary is a fence. Robert Frost wrote a well-known poem with the quote, good fences make good neighbors. If you take the time to go read the full poem, what he's really talking about is not just the physical presence of the fence, but he's talking about the neighbors working together to build the fence, to decide where to put it, and how high to build it, and what it will look like. And that's a good example of our relationships with other people. If we talk about where the boundaries are and decide where they are, they tend to be healthier relationships. Uh, of course, Carl Sandburg said, love your neighbor as yourself, but don't take down the fence. And Arthur Bear said, a good neighbor is a fellow who smiles at you over the back fence, but doesn't climb over it. The fact that boundaries exist in the doctor-patient relationship does not mean the relationship is not loving, does not mean the relationship is not caring, it does not mean the relationship is not healthy. Having those boundaries, communicating those boundaries, demonstrates a good solid relationship. So we're going to start by talking about the boundaries for confidentiality. In this context I'm primarily going to discuss the uh, federal rules under the Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act, HIPAA as we all know it. But before I get to that I want to make a few brief comments about the Texas rules. Sometimes people forget that even though we have this brand new, well it's not so new anymore, but we have this overriding federal regulation, we still have rules in the state, both under the Texas Board of Chiropractic Examiners and under the Texas Chiropractic Act that govern confidentiality. If for some reason you have a practice that isn't covered by HIPAA, then you still have to comply with the Texas rules. In many ways, the Texas rules are not as clear and certainly not as extensive as the HIPAA rules, but the obligations, by and large, are going to be very similar. We also have what's often called House Bill 300 or HB 300, which was adopted about five years ago now in, in uh, 2011. The uh, uh, HB 300 was a response of the Texas legislature and generally what the rules, what, what the statute said, HB 300 said, was that the Texas state had the ability to enforce the HIPAA regulations. There was a concern that, <coughs> that the federal government was not doing enough to enforce those regulations. So the, the Texas legislature wanted to give the state the ability to enforce those regulations on its own. So in essence HB 300 says doctors in Texas must follow HIPAA. But it also added a little more detail or a few more areas into HIPAA to make it a little more oblig obligatory, uh, or not obligatory, but a little more burdensome in some ways. Uh, one thing it one topic in particular is it requires training for employees. Now HIPAA already requires training from employees, but HB 300 required that the training occur 
within 60 days after the employee was hired and that the employee be retrained every two years and that the employer keep verification that the training was completed. Now HIPAA generally requires reasonable training. It doesn't go beyond that. The uh, uh, Texas statute is more specific and I think because it's more specific people are were a little frightened by it. But it really is not all that burdensome if you think about it. If you're going to give a new employee access to confidential information it's hard to imagine a situation where you would wait 60 days before you train that employee. Now, the other thing I'll tell you about it is the uh, uh, state legislature looked at it again in 2013 when they met and softened the requirements somewhat. Now instead of requiring retraining within 60 days of hire, training is required within 90 days of hiring a new employee. And retraining is not required once every two years but required only if the law changes in a way that affects the employee's job. And in that case, retraining must occur within one year after the law changes. Now one thing that's a good idea, I don't think it's clear under the HIPAA regulations, but it is clear under HB 300. Doctors must keep verification that they perform the training. They need some kind of certificate or something signed by the employee to confirm that they have taken this training. Now that's a good idea anyway. It helps get a confirmation from the employee that they've taken the training. It helps impress upon the employee the importance of this training. And it can also be a useful time to get a further agreement from the employee that they're going to follow the, the rules to keep things confidential. As well as the rules on confidentiality, Texas also has some rules on record keeping. Uh, just in general, doctors are required to keep records for at least six years after the last date of treatment of a patient. If the patient was less than 18 years of age, the doctor is required to keep the records until the patient turns 21 or six years from the date of last treatment, whichever is longer. So in the case of a young patient, a four or five year old patient, the doctor may be obligated to keep those, pa those records for a number of years. The other thing the Texas record keeping statute does is it says if there's any other federal or state statute that requires you to keep the records longer, the doctor's required to comply with that statute. Generally, there is not another statute that requires that you keep those records that long. But what I have seen is that in most uh, plans where, where, where the doctor joins a network, in most of those plans, the doctor is expected, not, not expected, but required to keep the records for at least 10 years. Because that requirement exists, uh, uh, it just makes sense to me as a practice to keep the records for at least 10 years. Now, another comment on this is, is as easy as it is to scan records into the computer and to keep them on a, a USB drive or a computer drive someplace in a way that's very secure and also very readily available for the doctors and people who should have access to the records, I'm not so sure it doesn't make sense just to keep records forever. It's gotten easier and easier, and I expect as technology develops, it will get still easier. So that brings us to the topic of HIPAA. Now, when HIPAA was first adopted, when the regulations were first issued, uh, doctors were very concerned and in many ways fearful of the regulations. The HIPAA regulations are in many ways very detailed. But if you look at them, and, and we'll spend some time looking at a few of them, as you look at those regulations, they, they generally make pretty good sense and are pretty good practices for the doctor to follow. Just a few quick thoughts about the development of HIPAA. And as you see how it develops over many different years with many different Congresses and many different presidents in different administrations, you understand a little bit about why it sometimes seems so difficult to read uh, 
and why it sometimes seems uh, uh, such a challenge. Uh, the statute itself was passed by Congress in 1996, back when Bill Clinton was president, and he signed it into law. Now, the statute really doesn't say much about privacy, except that we ought to have a federal rule on privacy of health care records. And Congress wisely, I think wisely, decided that instead of them trying to come up with these rules, that they were going to delegate to the Department of Health and Human Services and expect the Department of Health and Human Services to decide what these rules should be. The Department of Health and Human Services published the first draft of the privacy rule in the year 2000, nearly four years after the statute was adopted. Of course, that was beyond the date expected in the statute, uh, and Health and Human Services had to be reminded several times by Congress that they needed to take care of this project. So the first draft was published in 2000, and I suspect that a lot of the concerns, a lot of the fears coming from HIPAA came out of that first draft. I suspect it was put together in a very hurried fashion because the department was trying to comply with some deadlines and get it issued while President Clinton was still president. The rules were published. They had some very clear problems in them, and one of the first things that the new administration, the George Bush administration, advised doctors was that they were going to rewrite those rules because there were some problems. So the second draft was published in 2001, and this draft corrected a lot of the problems, but even then there were still some problems, and, and the government did come back and clean up some of those problems in some amendments to the rules before they became effective. Now, one thing the government did well in this situation is they made it clear they were going to publish the rules and then give the doctors two years before they were expected to comply with the rules. So even though the second draft of the rules were published in 2001, doctors were not required to comply with the HIPAA regulations until 2003. Uh, in 2003, the privacy rule became enforceable and the department published their security rule. 2005, the security rule became enforceable. And then, by and large, from, from over that period, there were no changes to the statute. It wasn't until 2009 that Congress came in and acted again to make some changes to the uh, uh, HIPAA regulations. And this was called the High Tech Act. And it did, I think, in some ways, patch some problems that existed with, with the HIPAA regulations. The uh, uh, regulations under the High Tech Act were uh, put forth by the department in 2013. So over the years, you've seen a number of changes, or we've seen a number of changes to the regulations. I think they've gotten better in some ways. And although I think they are not very easy to read, I think they do a very good job of communicating in great detail what the expectations are about confidentiality of doctor-patient information. To help you remember how broad and all the topics covered by the HIPAA regulations, put together these, these quick little mnemonic devices to help you remember PTSD, NCAA, CIA, and APT, APT. PTSD are the four major sections of HIPAA. Privacy, transaction, security standards, and disclosure of breaches. NCAA are the four major parts of the privacy standards. They stand for notice, confidentiality, access, and amendment. CIA stands for the purposes of the security standards. Purposes are to provide confidentiality, integrity, and availability. An apt are the three sections or the three types of requirements under the security standards administrative standards, physical standards, and technical standards. I think most people when they think about HIPAA only think about privacy and they don't go much beyond that. 
For purposes of this presentation, I'm going to be talking mostly about the privacy standards and mentioning the others really only in passing. But the primary topic I want to talk about today are the privacy standards. General rule for privacy is pretty simple. A covered entity may not use or disclose protected health information except as permitted or required by the privacy rule. In other words, doctors cannot use or disclose patient confidential information. Now, if you look at that, it sounds real simple on its surface, but it can become complicated. One area of complication is what's a covered entity? As a general rule, if you're a health care provider, you're a covered entity. Of course, if you're a health insurance company or a health insurance plan, you're a covered entity. Also, health care clearing houses. It's possible as a health care provider to avoid HIPAA by not submitting information uh, uh, electronically. Now generally a health care provider is anybody who submits or provides health care. But not all health care providers are going to be covered. Uh, it is possible but very unlikely that some doctors operate in a way that they don't have to comply with HIPAA. But remember, even if the doctor has figured out a way to avoid complying with HIPAA, the doctor is still expected to comply with the Texas state rules. And part of that simple rule, again, a covered entity may not use or disclose protected health information, is this idea of protected health information. Now, the regulations give a fairly detailed definition of protected health information. I'll tell you as a rule of thumb and a, and a fairly good guide, if a doctor has information or a record about a patient that identifies the patient, that information should be treated as confidential. So that brings us to the four parts of the privacy standards. The NCAA. The N, as you'll recall, stands for notice. Now, before HIPAA was adopted, I think doctors and patients had essentially no communication about doctor-patient confidentiality. Now, the problem with that absence of communication is the doctor made one assumption about confidentiality, and the patient made a very different assumption about where that boundary existed. The doctor, through their training, understood that although things were generally confidential, there were also a lot of exceptions. The patient, on the other hand, tended to think there was essentially no exception. If they shared something with their doctor, it was kind of like sharing something with your priest in confession. It should never be disclosed. And that caused some problems because there were some situations where doctors would respond to subpoenas or would send information to an insurance company to, get, to collect their fees, and the patient would be surprised that the doctor had disclosed that information and the patient would be upset or complain that the information was disclosed. So the idea of this notice provision is for the doctor to clearly communicate to the patient what the patient's rights are about confidentiality and what the doctor's obligations are and make sure the patient understands that there are some exceptions. Now this is not a perfect way to do this and I think those of you that have been practicing know that it is very rare that a patient will actually read a notice of privacy practices. Essentially the regulations require that the doctor provide a notice of privacy practices to every patient, every new patient, and they need to try to obtain a written acknowledgement from every patient that they received that notice of privacy practices. Notice also needs to be available to anyone who asks for it. If the doctor maintains a web page, the notice should be available on the web page and it should also be posted in the doctor's office. If you've ever tried to read one of these notices of privacy practices, they, they tend to be very dense 
and not very easy to read. The government has given us a little bit of help in this area. And let me kind of walk through with you where you can find this on the internet. And that way if the government changes it, even though this, this lecture will still be out there, you'll be able to find the, the best current information. You start at the web page for the Department of Health and Human Services, hhs.gov. And if you look at the web page, it has a search box in the upper right area. I'm looking for. If you type in that search box, Model Notices of Privacy Practices, it'll bring you to a page or give you some choices to take you to a page that looks like this. And what you have here is the government has prepared some notices of privacy practices in English and Spanish, both for doctors or providers and also for health plans. We're not going to worry about the health plans for this lecture. But we are going to take kind of a quick look and it comes in several different formats depending upon what your preferences are. Whether you want a, a booklet or a layered approach with different sized pages or, or just a full page. And as you move to the full page example, the government's done a fairly decent job of putting some graphics and, and topo topography to make this somewhat easier to read than most of the notices of privacy practices that I've seen in my practice. Uh, the other thing it, it's done is it gives the doctor the ability to customize the form and do some things like put their name on it so it doesn't look like something the doctor just copied from the uh, uh, government. And as you go through, you can see they've used colors and, and, and headings uh, to help make it easier for the patient to see things about the exceptions and about their rights and responsibilities. Uh, the other thing that I think is nice about using the government's form is it's pretty safe to assume that the form complies with the federal rules. And it's very difficult for the government to argue that, that the form they provided to doctors was somehow defective in some way. So it does give you a little bit better situation. Hopefully you never have to have any of those discussions with the government. But it puts you in a little bit better situation in dealing with it. So that's the in or, or notice section under HIPAA. Which brings us to the C under NCAA, confidentiality provision. Again, the rule is very simple. The problem is the exceptions. Benjamin Franklin gave us the wise advice, when in doubt, don't. My general recommendation with the exceptions is to be careful about releasing information. Don't release information, don't disclose information, unless you are confident that it can be used in the way that you are disclosing it. And what the regulations do is give us a list of about a dozen different exceptions. Situations where the doctor can use or disclose the information that otherwise is confidential or protected health information. And I've grouped those exceptions into two areas. The, the common exceptions, I think, are the exceptions that a chiropractor is most likely to run into in a typical chiropractic practice. The less common exceptions, the, the next list, is uh, the kinds of exceptions that a doctor is less likely to run into in their practice. As we look at the HIPAA regulations, remember these regulations are designed for all kinds of entities. Everything from a single doctor practicing by themselves, to a large hospital system, to a large insurance company. So some of the exceptions really aren't going to make much sense in a typical chiropractic practice. Uh, first exception is for treatment, payment, and health care operations, or TPO. Second one is for incidental disclosures. Third one is for business associates. Fourth one is disclosures with the patient's consent or authorization. And the last one is disclosures for judicial and administrative proceedings. So let's take a look at each of those in a little more detail. Uh, the first exception is TPO, Disclosure for Treatment, 
payment and healthcare operations. Treatment basically means what you would expect, providing, coordinating, or managing health care by health care providers. As a general rule, health care providers are going to be allowed to use those records, that protected health information, for the purpose of treating the patients. That includes situations where a doctor is referring a patient to another doctor or where health care providers are consulting with each other to try to decide the best way of caring for a patient. Payment is also pretty straightforward. Uh, payment means activities of doctors to obtain payment or be reimbursed for their services. And doctors are going to be allowed to use protected health information for that purpose. Now the High Tech Act added one exception here uh, that I think is somewhat confusing. And the exception is that if a patient pays for a service out of pocket, the patient then has the right to demand that the PHI, protected health information, not be disclosed to health plan or insurance. Now that protected health information can still be used for the purpose of the patient's treatment or maybe for some of the other exceptions, but the doctor is prohibited from disclosing it to insurance companies. Now as a practical matter, I think the administration of that exception in a doctor's office is going to be a lot more complicated than the benefits that that, that exception creates. Um, obviously what Congress was trying to do was protect information. As long as the doctor was being paid, there really was no other reason for the doctor to be disclosing the information to insurance companies. The problem is when, when the doctor continues to treat the patient, there may come a time in the future when the insurance company asks for the patient records. And then the doctor has to figure out how to disclose the patient records without including this information and without tipping off the insurance company that this information is there. Uh, healthcare operations is also relatively straightforward. Uh, healthcare operations basically are the, the business side of running a healthcare practice. And protected health information can be used for healthcare operations. Things like administrative, financial, legal, and quality improvements or quality uh, assurance programs. Um, fraud and abuse detection business planning and development or business management general administrative activities. You can skim through those slides at, at your convenience, but the idea I want you to get here is that healthcare operations is a fairly broad exception and gives the doctor, or particularly in the case of a large hospital, gives the hospital the ability to share information across departments without regard to whether the information is being shared only for purposes of treating the patient may be shared for other reasons such as, you know, again, peer review, quality review, business planning, etc. Doctors may use or disclose protected health information by themselves. They may disclose treatment activities of a provider. They may disclose to another covered entity or a provider for recipients activities. Doctors may disclose to another covered entity if they are both treating the patient or they have a, a mutual relationship with the patient. By the way, individual in these regulations usually means patient. So that's TPO. So we start with this nice simple fence that says the doctor is not going to use protected health information, period and we create an exception or a gate in the fence for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. The second exception is for incidental disclosures. Now I think this rule was adopted to address some of the concerns about the initial rule. The rule allows the doctor to use confidential information and disclose it incident to an otherwise permitted use as long as the doctor follows minimum necessary safeguards and standards. Everybody's familiar with the sign-in sheet on the front desk. 
You walk into the doctor's office, you sign in to let them know you're there and what time your appointment is. The problem or the concern with the sign-in sheet is that the tenth patient walking in can see the identity of the previous nine patients. One of the first criticisms of the first draft of the HIPAA regulations is that it would have prohibited use of the sign-in sheet. It would have been a criminal act to use the sign-in sheet. That scared people, and I think it made sense to scare people. But the incidental disclosures was designed to address that concern by allowing that, that there are going to be situations where doctors are just doing the things that doctors usually do. But in the course of doing those things, information is going to be released. Information will be disclosed. And that's okay. Uh, that's not a violation of HIPAA uh, as long as reasonable safeguards are used. Now, in the context of the uh, uh, sign-in sheet, reasonable safeguards means you don't leave the page out forever. You put it away. Uh, and you don't leave it out day after day after day also means that you don't collect a lot of unnecessary information. If you start asking questions like what is your chief complaint, what's your insurance company, what's your credit card number, that kind of information changes the context or changes the idea of the sign-in sheet and, and really makes it inappropriate. A uh, couple other examples of incidental disclosures, the hospital directory. Uh, if you walk into the hospital and you say my friend's in the hospital, can you tell me what room they're in? under the initial draft of the regulations there would be some concern that they couldn't tell you. Uh, under the incidental disclosures exception the Department of Health and Human Services has made it pretty clear that that's okay. They've also made it clear that it's okay to send out appointment reminders. If you choose to send out a postcard uh, to remind your patients about appointments obviously that discloses that they are your patient and it also discloses what kind of doctor they're going to see and discloses when their appointment is. And that's all confidential information, isn't it? But under the idea of incidental disclosures, assuming the postcard is properly addressed, uh, that's not going to be a violation. Now, as a business practice, I recommend that you spend a little extra money to put the appointment reminders in a sealed envelope. I think that does a little bit better job of protecting your patient's confidentiality. And although some patients may not care, uh, for patients who are trying or are concerned about their confidentiality, uh, that may be a, a nice way for the doctor to show that we're trying to protect our patients. The next exception is for business associates. Essentially, a business associate is someone who works for the doctor who's not an employee. So it can be somebody like a bookkeeper or an accountant or an attorney who works for the doctor and has access to protected health information for the purpose of performing those services. Generally, the covered entity or the doctor is required to obtain satisfactory assurance that the business associate will appropriately protect the protected health information. Uh, the rules require a written contract or some other written agreement. Either there can be a specific written agreement for the uh, business associate contract or those terms and provisions may be included in another contract. The uh, rules do not require that the doctor monitor the business associate. Uh, the doctor is not, tried, not required to try to hack into their system or try to inspect the security of their system. The doctor is expected to make reasonable inquiries. And if you sign up with a company that, that makes it very clear that they are not HIPAA compliant, or a company that's been the subject of a bunch of HIPAA complaints, then you have a different concern. And the contract must provide that if the business associate uses or discloses protected health information in violation of HIPAA, then either the business associate will work to cure or remedy or fix the mistake or the doctor has the ability to terminate the contract once they know about the uh, uh, violation. So that's essentially the doctor's obligation. The doctor is not required to uh, uh, engage in an extensive investigation 
not required to monitor the business associate, but they are required to have a written agreement that includes appropriate terms, including terms that give the doctor a chance to learn about the violations committed by the business associate, and also gives the doctor a chance to terminate the contract when a violation occurs. Uh, the regulations go through and provide some some fair detail about what must be in that business associate agreement. Uh, HIPAA regulations have been around long enough that most vendors who work with uh, health care providers on a regular basis are familiar with those requirements and already have included those requirements in their contracts. If you need to draft a, a business associate agreement the government has provided you with, an ex with a, a sample. Again, we go to the website for the Department of Health and Human Services, and this time you will type in the search box, Sample Business Associate Agreement, and that will take you fairly directly to this page. When you do this, be sure you use the agreement that was published in 2013. There was an older agreement or a sample agreement published uh, about 10 years ago that does not comply or does not meet the requirements of the High Tech Act. So make sure you're using the current agreement, not the old agreement. And the agreement is set up so that you can copy and paste these provisions and either use them as a standalone separate agreement or incorporate them into a different agreement. And it comes through and it gives you some in, in brackets gives you some instructions about how to complete the form and tells you which sections are, are optional and which ones have to be included. Next exception is patient's authorization. It makes sense that if the patient has authorized a doctor to disclose the protected health information that that should be allowed. Uh, the rules do make it clear that the doctors, as a general rule, cannot condition treatment, payment, eligibility, or enrollment on the patient willingness to sign an authorization. In other words, you can't refuse to treat a patient if they are unwilling to sign that authorization. There are also some more specific rules that require a few more steps or specificity if the disclosure involves psychotherapy notes, or if the disclosure is for marketing purposes. The rule spells out what needs to be in that authorization. Okay, it was fairly common before this to require a, or, or allow a patient consent through a written authorization, but the HIPAA rules are a little more explicit in what needs to be in that statement. Uh, some of the things you might need to know is, is number one, the authorization should have an expiration date. And that can either be a specific date, or it may be an event, or it may be a provision that says it never expires. Uh, the authorization also needs to include a statement that it is revocable. The patient can change their mind. The patient has always had that right, but now it's required to be part of that authorization so the patient can see it in writing. Authorization should also disclose the purpose of the requested use. Now, it can be something as simple as the patient's request, or it may be more detailed, like for pursuit of a personal injury case, or a, from a motor vehicle accident, uh, or for some other purpose. To find a patient consent, uh, uh, the Texas Attorney General published an authorization, and it's a fairly straightforward two-page form. Uh, the print is fairly small. Now this was available on the Texas Attorney General's website. Uh, unfortunately as I'm recording this we have a new Texas Attorney General who took office just a few weeks ago and they're in the process of moving the website around. So I have some concern that this may become more difficult to find but I suspect it will still be available out there. It's called an Authorization to Disclose Protected Health Information, and it was designed by the state to comply with the HIPAA regulations and to also comply with the requirements under House Bill 300. Um, the nice thing about using this form, if you ever, 
present this to another health care provider, it will be very difficult for them to argue that this form does not comply with those statutes. So those are the most common exceptions that you're going to run across in a chiropractic practice. Uh, TPO, Treatment and Payment and Healthcare Operations, Incidental Disclosures, Disclosures to Business Associates, Disclosures with the Patient's Consent, and then the last one that I almost forgot to talk about was Judicial Proceedings. If a doctor receives a subpoena, then obviously they are allowed to respond to that subpoena and to uh, provide the information that's requested or required to be provided under court order. Uh, and that makes sense if you think about it, and that applies to uh, civil lawsuits, criminal lawsuits, and administrative proceedings. The less common exceptions are exceptions first for other people involved in the patient's care, public health activities, abuse and neglect, health oversight activities, law enforcement, serious threats to health or safety, de-identified information, and workers' compensation. First one is disclosures to other people involved in the patient's care. Now, as a general summary of this rule, what the government has done is, is defer to the doctor's good judgment to decide whether to make disclosures in front of family members and friends involved in caring for the patient. Uh, if the patient is not present or is incapacitated, as a general rule, uh, the doctor should make decisions based on the best interest of the patient. So for example, and this isn't something that should happen in a chiropractic practice, or certainly not often, if a patient is unconscious or having an emergency situation like a stroke or a heart attack, uh, the doctor is allowed to notify the family to let them know about the patient's condition and to let them know where the patient is located. Uh, the next exception is public health activities. Uh, reporting information like infectious diseases, reporting information to the FDA, uh, etc. is as required by the government is an, not a violation of HIPAA. Uh, reporting abuse and neglect, and we're talking about child abuse, uh, abuse of elderly or disabled persons, and spousal abuse. Those reports can be made as long as they're made to the appropriate government authority. Okay, making the report to the newspaper or making the report on your Facebook page doesn't get you there. Uh, health oversight activities. Uh, basically, all these words come down to a lot of different meanings, but one way they get used is if Medicare comes in or Medicaid comes in and wants to audit the doctor's records, they are going to get to audit the doctor's records. Uh, judicial and administrative proceedings, this slide is in the wrong place and I apologize for that. Again, remember that this is one of the exceptions when the doctor can report or disclose information. Uh, law enforcement purposes, uh, doctors can report things like crimes that have occurred in their office or they can report fugitives that are hiding in their offices. Serious threats to health or safety. Doctors may require or may make disclosures uh, as necessary to protect the patient from hurting themselves or from hurting other people. Now, even though the law may not always require that the doctor make that disclosure, I think there is a moral obligation that the doctor should make that disclosure. De-identified information is a very common sense exception. Uh, basically it says as long as all the information that identifies the patient is removed from the record, the doctor no longer has to keep the record confidential. The uh, uh, one example of this is radiologists who, who teach radiology will sometimes want to show a film from a real patient to their class. They can do that as long as they have removed the information from the film that would identify the patient. Okay, that means all the anything involving including the patient's name or part of the patient's name, the patient's social security number, etc. Uh, 
Now, workers' compensation is kind of an interesting exception. Remember, the idea behind HIPAA was to create a federal rule so that there would be some uniformity across all the states about what was expected or what was required to be confidential and what was not required to be confidential. Government got to workers' compensation, realized that we have 50 different states. Every state requires something a little bit different from the doctors the information that's reported, how it's reported, etc. And essentially what the Department of Health and Human Services did with the HIPAA regulations was to look at this and say, you know what, we don't know the answer. So if the state requires, as part of the workers' compensation program, that information be disclosed, we're just going to say there's an exception that says that is not a violation of HIPAA. So if you're working with workers' compensation patients, and you are making reports that are required by the state, that will not be a violation of HIPAA. When doctors are making disclosures, they should disclose the minimum amount of information necessary. Now, now these guidelines here really apply to all of the exceptions. And the idea here is that when some information needs to be disclosed, the doctor should not be disclosing a lot of extra information. Accounting of disclosures. Now this was always a good practice, but I think HIPAA was the first statute I saw that required it. In other words, the doctor is requir required to keep track when the information leaves their office or is shared with somebody else. And if a patient requests a copy of their record, Part of the information that should be provided to the patient is an accounting that says we have shared or, or sent your records or, or copies of your records or we have shared some information from your records in these circumstances to these people. So for example in a personal injury case the accounting of disclosures may reflect that the records were disclosed to the patient's attorney that the records were disclosed to the insurance company on the other side, that the records were disclosed in response to a subpoena, uh, and perhaps that discussions were conducted with the patient's attorney. Uh, in all those situations, information may have been disclosed, and the benefit of having that accounting is it now shows that if confidential information has been released, it shows that that information may have been released from somebody other than the doctor's office. Uh, next comment that applies to all these exceptions is, is as a general rule, and it makes sense, uh, doctors should not be selling protected health information. Uh, there are some very specific rules involving this. I think most of the reason for adopting those rules was concern that some doctors were sharing their information with pharmaceutical companies and the pharmaceutical companies would then send marketing information to those patients that fit certain categories. And that just didn't make sense by any stretch of the imagination. So that brings us to the first A uh, in NCAA, access denied. Uh, patients have a right to see their records. Patients have a right, if a patient requests to see their records or request a copy of their records, they will get, the patient should receive those that information. Uh, even though this rule is, to me, incredibly simple, the Department of Health and Human Services publishes annually a list of the types of complaints that they are seeing. And, and the curious thing to me is this third most common complaint every single year going back to 2003 every single year the third most common complaint has been doctors denying patients access to their own records there simply is no excuse for that and there's no reason for it I think sometimes it happens because doctors are not uh, uh, well organized from a business aspect so they don't respond appropriately or in a timely manner to provide those records. Generally under HIPAA the information must be provided within 15 business days. Or excuse me, under HIPAA it's 30 days, but under the Texas rule it's 15 business days. Uh, doctors in Texas must comply with the Texas rule. 
There is no lien on the records for unpaid fees. Uh, the doctor is allowed to charge a reasonable fee for the records. Reasonable fee is set out in the Texas regulations uh, published by the Texas Board of Chiropractic Examiners. Uh, and that's all that a doctor is entitled to collect for that information. Um, the last A is amendment. Now this is something that I think was new under the HIPAA regulations. I don't remember seeing any regulations or statutes that said a patient had a right to request an amendment. Now requesting an amendment does not mean that the patient will always get their record changed. All it means is that the patient must be allowed to make a request to correct the records. Uh, the doctor has the discretion to decide not to make the corrections uh, for different reasons, two of the most common reasons, or the mistake is not in a record created by the doctor. So for example, if a, a doctor is treating a patient and as part of taking on treatment of the patient, the doctor obtained records from another doctor, a previous doctor, and those records from the previous doctor include a mistake. The new doctor is unable does not have the right to go back and change the records of the previous doctor. But the patient can make that request to the previous doctor and get the records corrected in that way. And then have the previous doctor send a new set of records to the new doctor. The other situation that sometimes occurs is patients will essentially ask the doctor to amend the record to create something that is not true or might be misleading. If the record is already accurate incomplete, the doctor may decline or refuse to amend the record. Now this doesn't seem to happen very often, or I haven't heard of it happening very often. If a doctor receives a, a request to amend a record, if they agree with the request, the doctor should amend the record. It does not mean destroy the old record, but to amend the record to show that the correction has been made. If the doctor decides not to amend the record, the doctor does not agree with the request, the doctor should send a written statement back to the patient explaining why they are not correcting the record, uh, and that should be the end of that. So as straightforward as these rules are, we still have some problem areas. Now let's talk for a few minutes about some of those problem areas. Uh, one common theme that shows up in a lot of the HIPAA complaints is lost laptops. A lot of doctors offices and hospitals trust their employees to take patient confidential information away from the office on laptops or smartphones or tablets and sometimes those employees will leave those laptops on, on things like buses or taxis or they'll be stolen. And the concern is now that whoever stole that device has access to a considerable amount, or could be a considerable amount, of doctor-patient information affecting a large number of patients. The question here is, how do you protect yourself? And HIPAA gives you the answer. If the information is encrypted, and the encryption key is not readily available with the device. If the information is encrypted, not just password protected, but encrypted, then that information is considered protected, and even though the laptop or other computer device is stolen, there's no requirement to notify the patients that that breach occurred. And there's no requirement, or there's no punishment by the government. On the other hand, if the information is not encrypted, then the doctor is at risk for being sanctioned by the government and has an obligation to notify all the patients whose information was on that laptop. Pretty burdensome. Uh, something else that seems to be occurring involves digital copiers. A lot of doctors in hospitals don't seem to realize that digital copiers have a computer hard drive on them. And the way they make those digital copies is they actually make an image of the documents and they save that image. Uh, some hospitals will lease their copiers uh, 
and return their copiers to the leasing company with those hard drives intact and unerased. Uh, Health and Human Services has disciplined those hospitals. Now, as you can imagine, that affects a large number of patients, and it's an exceptionally careless mistake, so that those fines can be fairly stiff. Now, in a typical doctor's office, a chiropractor's office, uh, I would be careful about digital copiers. If you lease a digital copier that has to be returned at the end of the lease, be absolutely certain that the hard drive is erased before the copier is returned. Um, and that applies to all other electronic equipment, fax machines, etc. in your office. Make sure the information is removed from it and not just erased in a way where it can be recovered, but an erased in a way that nobody can, can get back into that information. Uh, another situation that seems to come up is, is records being tossed in the dumpster. Uh, doctors need to be sure that they don't throw records in the dumpster before they've been shredded or otherwise destroyed, and they need to make sure their employees understand that they cannot destroy that or, or dispose of those records without shredding or destroying them. Uh, social websites are a new area. Social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, etc. You know, all of those websites create an opportunity for doctors to disclose confidential information. And some doctors have been disclosed for information they have posted on Facebook. The other risk in those areas is that sometimes patients will be sending messages to doctors without realizing how insecure and how public those request or that information might be. So in connection with those social media websites, be very careful about the information that you post. If you see patients posting or, or disclosing information that should not be disclosed on those uh, social media websites, you should direct the patient to communicate to you in a more appropriate way, like sending a message to your personal email. So that brings us to the T in PTSD. We've talked about the privacy standards. I'm going to briefly mention the transaction standards. Essentially, the idea behind these rules is to create a uniform format for electronically submitted records. Essentially, this is a software question. Uh, as long as the doctor is using appropriate software and using the proper codes, their records should comply with the transaction standards and code sets. The S in PTSD is for security standards. The security standards are written essentially like a checklist. It's a, a list of about 40 or 45 standards that doctors should follow in their practice. Now the purposes are not just confidentiality, it's also to protect integrity and availability, or CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Integrity means we want to make sure the records are accurate. They haven't been changed by somebody who didn't have authority to change them. And availability means that the doctor is able to uh, have access to the records even though a disaster has occurred. And of course, a disaster can be something as simple as a hard drive failure. So the regulations are a list of, of standards for the doctor to follow to protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And it's divided uh, uh, into APT, APT, Administrative, Physical, and Technical Standards. Uh, we can talk a little bit about using checklists and whether it's a good idea to use checklists. Uh, there's a nice little book called The Checklist Manifesto written by an MD, Dr. Atul Gawande. And part of what he does in this, this book is he talks about some of the different people who use checklists and talks about the value of the checklist and then talks about how they developed a checklist for surgeons to use during surgery to make sure things are done appropriately. And what they found in those situations is, is that when the surgeons in the hospitals follow a checklist, things like the uh, infection rate or complication rate goes way down because the doctors and their nurses do a better job 
of taking care of those patients. Which brings us to the last part of the uh, uh, PTSD, the D for disclosure. Part of what HIPAA requires is that if a disclosure has occurred, if a breach has occurred, if a doctor has inappropriately used information, if something like a laptop has been lost with unencrypted information, the doctor is required to notify the patient, is also usually required to notify uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. So it's a good idea to minimize the risk of those breaches. But in, in the real key here is you need to understand that if a breach occurs, a doctor needs to take action fairly quickly. Now I'm not going to go into detail about what's required in the notices or the timing of the notices. Just be aware that it's fairly quick. Certainly within a week or two after a breach has occurred or a doctor has learned of a breach, they need to start taking action to start getting ready to notify the government and the patients that that breach occurred. A few quick comments on, on enforcement of HIPAA. When the regulations were first published, uh, there were some people who were predicting that a large number of doctors were going to find themselves in jail because they could not or did not comply with HIPAA. And I don't think that's occurred in reality. Uh, although there's been a large number of HIPAA complaints, uh, uh, the government is disposing of most of those complaints appropriately. This is the government's chart to explain the enforcement process. So far, the process has been driven primarily by complaints. When the government receives a complaint, the first thing it does is review it. And in about 60% of the time, they're going to take it and dispose of it this way. The complaint doesn't state a violation of HIPAA or was not made in a timely manner. So the government takes it and they're done with it. The other 40% or so of the cases result in an investigation. When the Department of Health and Human Services investigates those cases, they do not always find that the doctor committed a violation. Uh, about two-thirds of the time they find no violation, and about a third of the time they do find a violation. When they find a violation, most of the time they will reach a resolution to prevent that violation from occurring again. They're not trying to put people in jail. They're not trying to collect fines. Now they are collecting fines in some cases. Most of the cases where they're assessing administrative fines have involved disclosures that affected a large number of patients. Because it, they have focused on disclosures affecting a large number of patients, it's relatively rare to see a chiropractor being disciplined. Now, there is one development or one area I want to make you aware of and want you to keep an eye on, and that concerns audits. Uh, HIPAA is authorized to conduct audits, to contact doctors randomly, just like the IRS audits tax records. Uh, the government, however, has not funded that audit process. So even though there's been some talk about audits, and I think people are concerned that audits are going to come in the near future, and I think that may happen at some point, but until the government is ready to put its money behind that audit process, it's going to be a very, uh, uh, it's just not going to have much impact. Now, I do suspect or I, I do recommend that that audit process or that doctors be ready for that audit process so that if and when it does come about, the doctors are in compliance and don't have to worry about that audit process. But it, that is going to be something, a new development that I think over the next five, five to ten years uh, is something that's going to change the way HIPAA is enforced. So let me end this part of the lecture with a few quick thoughts about HIPAA. Uh, no one gossips about other people's secret virtues. Usually when information, confidential information is disclosed, it's not because it paints someone in a favorable light. Uh, 
uh, all these regulations and checklists involve a lot of work and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, Peter Drucker said that plans are only good intentions unless they immediately degenerate into hard work. Planning to comply with HIPAA is, doesn't get it done. It's going to require th that the doctors and their staffs do some work. Uh, Thomas Edison had this quote, the reason a lot of people don't recognize opportunity is because it usually goes around wearing overalls looking like hard work. Some doctors approach HIPAA as something to be afraid of. I think a better way to approach HIPAA is to look at this as an opportunity to number one, improve the doctor-patient relationship, communicate the boundaries in that relationship, make sure the patient is aware of when exceptions may apply, what information is confidential, what information is not confidential, and avoid misunderstandings in that area. Number two, these regulations give the doctors an opportunity to provide better protection for confidential information. I think the, the regulations like the detailed checklist and the security standards give some pretty good guidance to doctors and their staffs of things they can do, probably ought to be doing already, to protect confidential information. And the last comment is, is approaching HIPAA as something to be afraid of and getting mad at the government because they adopted these ridiculous regulations really is not a very useful practice. Uh, think about this quote from Nel Nelson Mandela. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. If you get mad or upset about these regulations, it will have no effect on the government. But what it will do is it will impact your health and your ability, your willingness to follow these rules and to use these rules for your benefit and for your patient's benefit. So that concludes the discussion about HIPAA and the boundaries for patient confidentiality. The second part of this lecture will be on the boundaries to prevent yourself or to protect yourself from sexual misconduct. Thank you.